So every week, Ryan and I spend time thinking about what will be on the banner here. And I, I felt like I needed to explain a bit what this is about. So the square blotch on the left has to do with our relationship with God being transactional. And the love heart blotch on the right is to symbolize our relational relationship with God. So as you look at that, I, I hope that's, that you find that helpful, actually. And uh, someone asked me today about this morning in the first hour about the altar, and I want you to focus on baptism as we go through uh, worship today. You know, along with teaching our young children to say please and thank you, one of the first things we teach them is hand washing, right? They go to the bathroom, they come out, and we say, did you wash your hands? And then we say it's time to eat, and then we always say, wash your hands, and they come out maybe too fast, and you go, well, let me see your hands. We want to make sure they're clean, right? And Montessori schools have really gotten into teaching their youngest how to wash hands. Apparently there are 30 steps to wash your hands in a Montessori school. How about, how about that, Tracy, for the preschool? <laughs> but it helps prepare preschoolers to begin to learn to care for themselves. When I, my first day in my residency at the hospital as a chaplain, our supervisor threw each one of us a tiny bottle of hand sanitizer. Now, we have seen hand sanitizers this last year ad nauseum, right? But, you know, back then, uh, it was one of the first times I held a little bottle of hand sanitizer. And, and Ted then showed us how to squirt it in our hand and how much we had to squirt in and then how to wash our hands with the hand sanitizer. And so then for what seemed to be the next 10 minutes, all eight of us in that circle were going through the motions of cleaning our hands. We were then told that before we go into any patient's room, we needed to hit that little button on the wall, get that hand sanitizer going, and to walk into the room like this to help people who, you know, the patients realize indeed our hands are clean. And when we walked out, we hit the little button again to make sure whatever we got in that room, because many of us would have been, you know, touching and holding hands with the patient, we would do that whole process over again so not to spread germs. You know, hands, having clean hands has been very important in the last year. In fact, we have seen uh, public health officials from the top show us on TV how to wash our hands. We had to sing the happy birthday song to make sure that we were washing our hands long enough and so that we were clean. It has become that hand washing has become not only uh, assume the role in our commitment to have personal hygiene, but also in the commitment to love our neighbor and to protect one another against COVID. Good hygiene practices have been around for a very long time. It is widely thought that many of the prohibitions, the rules and regulations that you find in the Old Testament were put into place because of public and personal safety concerns, like the law against eating shellfish. How many out there like shellfish? Shrimp, you name it, right? So um, is it really unclean to have sh a shrimp or your favorite lobster? Um, <laughs> as if we have lobsters running around in Nevada. But, um, but you know, perhaps there was an outbreak of, an un uh, of disease because there was a bad batch of crustaceans in the middle of the desert, which would seem likely, right? And so that got placed into that do not eat shellfish lineup. However, over time, those list of rules in the Leviticus became more than health considerations. The religious leaders, such as the Pharisees, adopted even more laws than the 600 that are found in the Old Testament. 
The Pharisees were diligent to follow those regulations, but gradually they used their power and their position to impose what they thought was ethically correct on to others. In fact, they would badger them, uh, uh, you know, fellow Jews, when they would slip up in, on their cleanliness protocols. Can you imagine eating your shrimp and having someone tap you on the shoulder or thunk you and say, you are not a good believer, a Jewish believer. So that in their fixation on following the law and enforcing the law, they actually missed the person to whom the law points. And this seems to be their fundamental struggle with Jesus. Jesus comes along and keeps trying to show them God while they consistently question Jesus about why he doesn't do what they think is godly or what they think is required. All these conflict, I'm sorry, all these complex rules pile up over the centuries and hindered, if not prevented, the people from knowing and experiencing God's unconditional love for them. And yes, morning and evening, they would repeat the Shema prayer, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, that was handed down by the ancestors, but the view of their relationship with God or God's relationship with them moved from a loving creator, one who desires companionship with all of us, to a distant deity who would not send them a Messiah or the Messiah unless every one of God's people followed all the rules. I, in seminary, one of the first classes in understanding, um, I think it was a New Testament class, the professor says, don't give the Pharisees such a hard, you know, uh, don't be so down on the Pharisees. They were just trying really hard to follow the rules, what they thought they were supposed to do. And yet I'm pretty hard on them today. The God who said at creation that humankind was made in the image of God God said it was good, gradually became viewed as one who looks down upon them to punish. They came to believe God relates to them in a transactional way rather than a relational way. And Jesus, on the other hand, exhibit God's compassion and extended love and grace even to those the pharisaical law deemed impure or unclean sinners. And this included the diseased and the disabled, the old, the young, the rich and poor, and people of all genders, married, single, widowed, divorced. Under Jesus, it, they were all loved for who they are, beloved children of God. And daily, Jesus showed through his actions that God is a relational Creator, that God desires to be relational. But it's still easy for us today to think of God as the old white man upstairs with that long beard, looking down with eyes that seem to search for missteps. It's one reason that I'm not fond of the old time children's song. I don't know if you have heard this song. He sees what you do, he hears what you say, my God is watching all the time. This song helps perpetuate the idea that we only receive love, compassion when we do good, when we keep in line. And this thinking of God looking down on us, monitoring our every move affects our self-worth. We come to believe that our worth is based on what we give and what we provide and what others think about us. We fear that God will punish us if we have not followed a set of strict rules in a certain way. And so then we are motivated by fear rather than love. 
when we believe our relationship with God is transactional, it then will trickle down and out to all of our relationships. It affects how we see one another. We begin to relate with a top-down mentality rather than seeing one another in that equal circle of grace. We keep score. We relate in a quid pro quo type of way. I'll do this if you do that. You didn't come through on that, so I won't do that. I can't help you. And then we may even think, you know, if I do this, what will I get? Or we say, you should be grateful. I helped you out last week. We become indebted to people in unhealthy ways, and we work to have others indebted to us. The Pharisees were so concerned that the disciples and Jesus were carrying out the ritual of cleaning that they missed experiencing Jesus' compassion. They missed communing with Jesus. They missed experiencing God's love. Not only did they live in fear of getting it wrong, they passed this fear onto a whole milieu of people. Fear ruled the day. But Jesus, Jesus lifted up God being loved. Jesus spoke to the heart of the matter. Jesus' life was an example of living from the heart. I like how Reverend Dr. Barbara Holmes describes life for one who lives within the belief of a relational God. I think you can see it on the screen there. She says, if we can believe that we are loved just as we are and that everything else is equally loved, we unveil a cosmic reality that is life-giving and a Christ-like reality that affirms the goodness of all creation. If we believe that we are loved just as we are, and as you look around at everyone else that you meet, that they too are equally loved, we unveil, we uncover the reality that a life-giving reality, a Christ-like reality that affirms goodness in all creation. When we receive and rest in God's love, then I believe that all else will change. Our tone becomes compassionate, loving. We develop a willingness to listen. We view our neighbors with love and acceptance, no matter their race, their gender, their sexual preference, their economic status, not even if they don't wash their hands the same way we do. Now, that being said, Jesus doesn't overlook sin. We see that in the gospel reading today, but Jesus points out that it comes from within. He points out that sinning is a relational matter and that God doesn't love us less. I became a United Methodist member during my last year of seminary. My pastor, uh, Pastor Denny, took me to meet the district superintendent, whose name was Marlon. Marlon was concerned about my theology, how I viewed God. I knew that the big question underlying Marlon's concern and why he was bringing me in was he was wondering, what did I think about baptism? My previous denomination didn't baptize babies one was baptized when they had a commitment to follow Jesus, when they had done the work, so to speak, when they understood what it meant to be a Christian. And it turns out that infant baptism is the, one of the main reasons I felt led to become Methodist. Baptism is a means of grace, and our baptism liturgy reminds us that through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. Through the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit, we are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth. It is in baptism 
we are reminded that we are saved not by works, not by what we do or didn't do, not by how we clean our hands or follow the rules. It's God's love and grace that saves us. Our salvation stems from a relational God who invites us, all of us, to come and join the circle of grace. All of this didn't just make sense to me, but I knew from experience that if a child, an infant, knows love, experiences love, if someone believes that they are a child of God and know that someone believes in them, they will flourish. So how about you? Do you need to view God in a transactional way? Are you living from or are you living from your heart? Are you experiencing God in a relational way? Do you read your Bible because that's what you're supposed to do? Or do you read out of an insatiable desire to encounter God? Do you do works of service such as the meals at St. Timothy or bringing your canned goods today for the, the food pantry at St. Stephen's because it's the right thing to do? Or do you serve with the honest desire to connect with and show care for another human being? My friends, as we embrace Jesus' view of God, as we follow Jesus and receive God's unconditional love, as we rest and live within that love, we will live from our hearts. We will live to connect relationally and the world around us will be transformed. Amen.